tipping point moments are moments of great pressure in our life. And that's where I want to center our conversation. Because what is pressure? Right? It's the continuous physical force exerted on or against an object by something in contact with it. Tipping point moments. Moments where the kingdoms of the world and the kingdom of God are colliding are pressure-filled moments. Because from an emotional standpoint, this is by definition what pressure is. The burden of physical or mental distress, the constraint of circumstance, the weight of social or economic imposition, the stress or urgency of matters demanding attention. So it's in the tipping point moments that this pressure begins to rise. And so I've been thinking about this pressure analogy and what that looks like and how under pressure weak points get exposed. And when I was in middle school, uh, I had a woodshop class. Now, does that still happen today? Do we know? Is woodshop still a thing, or is that like, eh, maybe not, maybe not, maybe so? Okay, so in my woodshop class, uh, we had this big end-of-the-year project where we had to design our own bridge, and it was made out of like, like small pieces of wood and glue, and the whole point of that project was to see how much weight that this bridge design could hold. I think it looked something like this. I found some, some pictures online. This is not my bridge. Mine would have looked much cooler than that. But you see, the key to success in this project was not just the design, but it was also the execution. And this is where I struggled a little bit. I think I had a pretty good design. It was fairly uh, astute, in my opinion. Um, But if you know me, um, I am not the most handy individual. I'm I'm far from a carpenter. And so I I feel like I'm more of a project manager than a contractor. but we'll just leave that there. So, see, the problem is execution is actually really important for this project because each joist and each truss has to be completely tight and it has to fit together well because if there's a crack in the wood or a gap in between the trusses, um, when that pressure comes in and it starts to press down on that, those moments, those places, those seams are where everything cracks and breaks and crumbles. And obviously the same is true, of course. You see where I'm going in our personal, emotional, and spiritual lives. When we're at tipping point moments, the cracks and the imperfections of our own brokenness, if they are not dealt with, if they are not healed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, then we will break and we will crack and we will crumble. You see, my bridge, when the weight got added, looked more something like this pretty quickly. It fell apart really quickly because I had a lot of gaps and cracks in my execution. And instead of me, my middle school self, instead of taking the time to make sure everything was aligned within the grand design of the creator, I chose to fill in all those gaps with stuffing them with wood glue and little pieces of filling. And when the weight was added and the pressure began to rise, it fell apart at the seams. See, it's in tipping point moments when we feel like we have come to the end of ourselves and we are longing for breakthrough that I believe there begins to rise inside of our hearts and our spirits this fight or flight kind of mentality in our hearts. There's pressure all around us, and it kind of hems us in, and it distorts our vision, and it makes us uncomfortable. And it's in those times that we want to run away, but it's also in those times that we need to fight. But the amazing thing, and hear me on this, about what we're diving into in this series as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, is that as a follower of Christ, you do not need to fight as the world fights. Rather, your job is to just cling to your Father and allow him to continually fill you with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you are fighting by the power of the Spirit at work in you for breakthrough. The Holy Spirit, the power, the promise for our breakthrough. And so today, what I wanted to do is take some of our time and look at a story in the Old Testament. As we said, we're going to go back and forth between conversations about the Holy Spirit, but also practical teachings in the Old Testament about these tipping point moments. And I wanted to look at a tipping point moment that went the other way, a moment of pressure on the people of God that actually moved them more toward flight than fight a moment when they opted more for filler than fulfillment to get them through, a moment that really led them closer to a breakdown. It's a moment in the Exodus journey in Exodus 32, and it takes place this moment after some amazing and powerful moves of God have taken place. I mean, God, through Moses, has miraculously saved the Israelites, delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. They have then crossed the Red Sea. It was parted on either side. They walked through on dry ground. They've been led by a pillar of fire and a cloud. They have been set free. However, now, in the midst of the desert, they find themselves at a bit of a tipping point. They're free, but they've not yet reached the promised land. 
And we see that in this time, their leader, Moses, he went up to the mountain because he needed to hear from God on what was next and who they were going to become. He wanted to get into God's presence. And he's been up there for a while, and he's not yet come down. And so they are waiting there. They're waiting for their leader, and they're waiting on a word for the Lord. And this is what occurs. Read with me in verse 1, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So what we see here in this moment is that the people of God, the Israelites, are at a tipping point moment. And here they find themselves kind of flying off the handle a little bit. They're turning from God. They're indulging in in comforts and worship of their past life. And I think there's a tendency, sometimes when we approach this text from a Christian lens, um, sometimes we're teaching us into it, we get to these moments of Israel because it's constant throughout the Old Testament. And we're like, oh man, here they go again. How could they? God's been so faithful. They always forget and they always mess up. But this morning, I really just want us to take a moment and set ourselves in their situation. Because the text doesn't give us a lot of detail, but it doesn't take much reflection and imagination to truly start to think through how these people are really feeling in this time. Because my heart's really going out to the Israelites here. They've been a a nation in slavery for 400 years. That means generation after generation, all they have known is is abuse and slavery underneath the regime. Uh, They've been captives of the Egyptians. They've been told how to live. They've been told how to work. They've been told how to worship. So they, as a people, don't know what it's like to have rights, nor do their parents or even their grandparents. They don't know what it's like to have privileges. They don't have any practices. They don't have any reference to live out what it means to be free people now. They don't fully know who they are. They don't know what to do. They're lacking in identity as a people. And as that sets in for them, as they've now been released, and that pressure begins to rise, I'm sure so do feelings inside of them of anger and depression and anxiety. I mean, think about it. Like Feelings like anger make sense here. Like the desert, really? This is the plan? What, what are we doing here? Or maybe depression? Like just honest feelings like I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't think I can take much more of this. What are we waiting for? Or maybe that even gives rise to anxiety in their hearts. Is this all there is? Is there going to be more? Is Moses actually ever going to come down? What are we supposed to do? Are we going to die out here? So I think it's important for us to look at this moment and to understand Because we've talked about in this church, especially recently, that the freedom of God, that work of salvation, that work of the Spirit that takes place in your life is a past, present, and future reality. So that idea that we said you you have been saved, if you have accepted Jesus into your heart, that is a, a past reality that through the work of Jesus on the cross, that acceptance of him, that is something that has happened in the past. But you also are being saved. You are working out your salvation daily, being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. And ultimately, you will become completely saved in the new heaven, in the new earth, when we have complete, perfect communion with our Savior. And we kind of see this narrative played out here with the Israelites. They were saved. They were freed from slavery and bondage in Egypt. But they're now on this journey as they approach the promised land. And victory for them in this journey only comes through the power of God. And so I was thinking about this, and in the idea of like last Sunday, last Sunday in particular, was just a really beautiful Sunday, as we began to lay some foundation for the power and the beauty of the Holy Spirit, of how God has given us the Spirit for breakthrough, of how that God's plan for the world is a remnant of people filled with His Spirit, going out and bringing His good news to all the world. And I know many of us here in the church are beginning to be filled afresh with vision and power from the Spirit to experience the Spirit of God in new ways, to experience that love of Jesus in new ways. 
And that's amazing. That's fantastic. That's what it's all about. That's why we are here and doing what we are doing. However, I just wanted to articulate sometime this morning that it's, it's not just about a moment or an experience. And I think this text highlights that so well. There is absolutely power in a moment. We see moments, mountaintop moments throughout Scripture. There's healing in a moment. There could be salvation in a moment. There's breakthrough in a moment. But those moments are just the beginning. They're the gateway to God's grand plan for you in your life. There's an author, Arthur Wallace, that says this. However powerful the initial coming upon us of the Spirit may be, if this does not find expression in a life of prayer, the blessing will soon become a fading glory. A movement of God will last as long as the spirit of prayer that inspired it. This is so true of us as we encounter the spirit of God. And this is so true of what the Israelites are experiencing right now as they were delivered and they were set free. But really, that moment of freedom for them was just the beginning. And what we see in the Israelites in this account is that they did not sustain, sustain this movement by remaining in God's presence. And when we fall out of God's presence, and then we then find ourselves encountering pressure, encountering a tipping point moment, our cracks and our imperfections begin to be exposed, and our vulnerability is at an all-time high. So there's just a few points here that I think we can glean from this. That first, when we are under pressure... Pressure challenges our faith. Remember, he said, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We read that in Hebrews. We would expect this moment then for the Israelites to be a faith-building moment. These people had seen the miracles of God. They, he, they had been set free time and again by what he has done. We would think they have more than enough faith to wait it out here for Moses. But they don't. We actually, many believe this has been about six to eight weeks, and they're already falling apart at the seams. Their faith is draining from them in this moment. And in this moment, they have a, a choice to trust God or whether they're going to take matters into their own hands. And as we see here in this instance, that though there are many other times of great breakthrough for them, the people lose their nerve here. They succumb to that anxiety and that pressure, and they miss the breakthrough that's right there for them on the other side. Moses is up there going to get the directives and the words for how they can be a thriving community in this time. And instead, instead of waiting on that, they, they break down and they take this path that leads to an ultimate breakdown for many of them. They revert back to what they do know. They, we read, right, that they participate in bull worship, which is, uh, you know, how they fashion that calf, which is just something that they saw play out in Egypt in their life before. Essentially, what they're doing is just recreating what they've experienced in worship in the past before they were set free. They're recreating something that they're familiar with. They're recreating something in their life that they're comfortable with. And then not only are they they're trying to create some kind of control and something familiar, but they revert back to old behaviors as well, just to fill themselves in that moment of momentary comfort and pleasure. They were spending their time, it says, in drunken revelry, which means they were indulging, or other translations say, it's almost like as far as an orgy or this great massive party. They were bailing out, basically. They were giving up. They were giving in. They were reverting back to the ways of Egypt, not endeavoring into breakthrough that was available through the power of God. And that's because not only is our faith challenged in tipping point moments when we are under pressure, but I also think the voice of God is muffled when we are under pressure. In moments where we find ourselves under pressure, where that fear begins to rise inside of us because we're not exactly sure which way to go. Are any of you in that place right now? Not exactly sure which place to go? And you begin to question has God really brought me to this point? Is God going to continue to move in my life? And it's in those moments that we can allow the voice of God to be muffled or silenced in our heart and in our ears. It's in tipping point moments, moments of pressure, if we're not continually putting ourselves in position to be filled and to hear from the Lord in prayer because that pressure is clanging in our ears. If we're not allowing ourselves to be in place of community that can speak truth to us, in the word that can speak to us, in worship, so that the word of God can come into our hearts. If we're not rooting ourselves in truth, then we begin to lose that glimmer of the light that guides us. And not only do we lose the present light, but we lose that vision and that hope that has brought us to this point. Those, those, those beautiful moments, right? Those great moves of God in the past, those moves of the spirit, those begin to just fade into the background. They carry less and less impact in our lives. We just forget about them, and what becomes more prominent is our needs of today. And those become so much bigger than the great moves of God in our past. 
So just like the Israelites already forgetting beautiful moments of deliverance for themselves and forsaking it for momentary pleasure and control, that plays out in our life time and again. Because lastly, what we see is that this pressure distorts reality. Distorts reality. So later in the story, what we find out is that Moses comes down and he confronts Aaron, who was the leader at that time while he was up in the mountain. And he asks him, how, how did you allow this to happen? And, and Aaron says, oh, don't be angry. They wanted me to do it. You know how these people are. They, they gave me their gold and I threw it in the fire and this calf just came out. It's essentially what Aaron says. And in this moment, of course, Aaron should be standing up as a leader and declaring the power and strength of God over the people, reminding them, no, we were, we were dead to rights. We were slaves and we've just been set free. Don't forget that. Oh, we were, we were doomed at the Red Sea and God has saved us. Time and again, God has provided for us. But in this, instead, the pressure, Aaron, as a leader, it gets to him just like it gets to everybody else. And then additionally in this moment, when, when Aaron is called out by Mo, Moses, he doesn't just take ownership of his weak moment. He further distorts the truth. So not only now is he allowing the works of God in the past to be distorted, he's distorting reality, but here he's, he's stepping into this place almost of a victim mentality. He blames people, the other people, and he begins to lie. He says the calf just, just formed itself. I put it, I put it in the fire, and it just came out. In fact, it's this victim mentality, I believe, that is, is plaguing the Israelites in their entirety right now. Because in reality, the Israelites in this moment are absolute victors. In our life, in reality, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are an absolute victor. However, the, the pressure of the moment and the anxieties that they are experiencing, don't let them live into that victorious mentality. They're living into a victim mentality. And a victim mentality, mind you, is very different than being a true victim. I don't want to confuse that. But see, if you find yourself in this place, not living into the victorious call on your life through Jesus Christ, and instead becoming to step into a victim mentality in life, it begins to distort the reality that you're living in. So when you're in this place, everything is always somebody else's fault. A victim mentality leads you to blame everyone else for what's happening in your life, and sometimes that even leads you to blaming God for what's happening in your life. A victim mentality leads you to this place where you think the future is only holding bad things for you unless you yourself take matters into your own hands because no one's looking out for you but you, right? And this mentality begins to make us bitter. It makes us angry. It gives you that edge that you find in many of us in New York. It makes us unforgiving or self-righteous or at the very least lonely. So when you're in this place, it leads you down a path, I think, sometimes ultimately of depression as you attempt to satiate yourselves with things to just soak up that bitterness and that hurt and that loneliness. And this happens time and time again as we allow the voice of the enemy to be louder in our ears than the promises of God over our life. So tipping point moments. They're vulnerable moments because the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world are colliding. There are moments where the enemy wants nothing more to drag you back into captivity. The enemy wants to drag you back. These moments where you're vulnerable, where you're about to experience exponential breakthrough, he wants to drag you back into that bondage that you were once you were in, when in Egypt. Or if you've actually never even been set free, he'd love nothing more than to keep you in that bondage that you were never destined for from the beginning. The enemy wants to keep you out of the presence of God. The enemy wants you to stay lost. The enemy wants you to stay disillusioned in the middle of the desert because where the spirit of the Lord is, that is the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and the enemy wants you nowhere near that. The way of Jesus is the pathway to victory against the schemes of the enemy. Jesus was glorified. That means he, was di he died and he rose again so that we, like we said, could be a dwelling place of his presence, so that we could all just stand in that reality that he is in us and we are in him and he is in his Father. That's the victory that we stand in. And right now, in, in the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, we are in that in-between, that already but not yet where there is victory, but we have not seen the ultimate culmination of that victory. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that continual work, that's what continues to refine us. That's what, what builds us forward for ultimate victory. That's what moves us from being slaves, from being victims, to being victorious, and to being free. I like how N.T. Wright talked about this struggle in particular of the Exodus account. He says this, the trouble with the Exodus, of course, is that you can take Israel out of Egypt, but it's much harder to take Egypt out of Israel. As soon as they cross the Red Sea, the people grumble because they haven't enough to eat and drink. That sets the pattern for the next 40 years. It's only a short step from gratitude to grumbling. 
and people will gladly swap freedom for food and all sorts of other things as well. How true is that? What a short step from gratitude to grumbling in our lives. And it's that razor-thin edge, that short step, that's where the enemy does his handiwork. So this re- week in, in particular, I was, I was reading this account and, and just kind of praying over the people of God in particular in this moment. And I was just filled with this, just a sense of sadness. My heart really began to, to ache and break in a way that it hadn't done when I've approached this text before and just looked at the people of God in honesty in the moment that they found themselves in. I mean, they were so close to breakthrough in their life, yet they were being tripped up by their own devices. They had just been set free in one of the most amazing, captivating stories of all human history, and yet now they're finding themselves right on the edge of slavery of a different kind in this moment. I don't know about you, but I I read this story, and I just resonate with how they feel. Because God's done some amazing things in my life. He's set me free in, in, in powerful ways. But I still have doubts. And I still get afraid. And oftentimes, I still really feel the pressure in life. So there's times in my life, just being honest, where I'm really desperate to know the plan and what's next, and it just feels like God is silent. There's times where I'm completely unsure sometimes of who I am and what am I doing in this game of life. And I look back and I, and I see those times and I conjure up those memories where there's been moments of great bro- breakthrough. But I'm honest, there's also stories in my life, if you go back and you look at my narrative, that in the midst of those stories of great breakthrough and those, those high highs, there's also really low lows. There's tipping point, point moments in my life where I was just like the Israelites and I fell back. I didn't, I didn't tip toward the side of breakthrough. I tipped toward the side of breakdown. I don't know if any of you are with me on that. Maybe you're, you're teetering on that place right now in your life. But I have times where I just took matters into my own hands, where I reverted back, where I fled, where I was led into sin and regret in my life. These places where I gave my time to, these places where I gave my talent over to, that I gave my treasure and my resources to, and I, I thought it was going to give me life, and it ended up just hurting me. That's what's taking place in this story. That is what's breaking my heart as I look at the story, that these people right now, the people of God, his children, they're in a moment of drunken revelry for the moment. But they're just one step away from great wounds and emptiness and breakdown right on the other side. And church, God's heart for you is for breakthrough, not for breakdown. And God's heart is hurting for those of you that are going on your path right now toward a breakdown in your life or for those of you who are experiencing a breakdown. Because it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, and the, the, the freedom that you receive at salvation comes with the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit is our promise for breakthrough, to continually fill you and strengthen you. See, the Spirit of God, as I shared last week in particular, has come into my life and he has changed everything, and he's been so gracious to wash over me with love. He's reminded me of the ways I've been set free. He's washed me clean. The Spirit fills all of us with love and power and a sound mind. There's this ocean of love that we can fall into and it is never ending. And so as we, as we move towards a close and just sharing about just the, the state and an honest look at where the people of God were in this moment and resonate maybe perhaps deeply in that moment ourselves, I just want to say it's okay to be at a tipping point. It's okay to feel like you are under immense pressure in your life. Notice I said it's okay, it's not comfortable because it's not comfortable. But that's okay too. Because our God is a God of breakthrough. And he that began a good work in you will see it through to completion. And I've been thinking um, over this concept and this lately, and I just was thinking a lot about Martin Luther. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's the, basically the guy who had that great revelation of justification by faith alone that really set off the Reformation. Much of where we're standing and what we're doing in Christianity in the West today is so much just thankful that God gave him this revelation. But what a lot of us don't know about this man is that in the moment of this great revelation in his life, he was in the midst of a very deep and dark depression. Right at this moment of great breakthrough and revelation from the Spirit of God that literally changed the landscape of Europe and then from there on into the West, he was overwhelmed by darkness in his life. He was swirling the drain of depression. 
He can't come to the end of himself. He said, I'm sick and tired of striving to be good. I'm sick and tired of striving to be holy. He was wrestling with what he considered to be persistent brokenness in his life. He would wrestle with God. He would wrestle with his own sin. He would get angry at the world. And this is something that he battled continually all his life. This battle with depression, this battle with sadness, this battle with anxiety. And while it often takes different shapes and different turns for people at different times, for him there seemed to be this continually um, significant mark of this depression in his life. And this is how it was always featured. And I wonder if any of us resonate with this today. I'll close with this. Each time he battled with this depression, he, he experienced a feeling of profound aloneness. Each time he found himself in this place, he had a sense that God was singling him out for suffering. Each time he battled in this place, he found, he found that he had a loss of faith that God was actually good, and that God was actually good to him in particular. And each time he found himself in this place, it resulted in an inward self-reliance. The pressure of life just seemed unbearable to him in these times. But it was in the depths of his darkness that he began to cry out to God. He began to cry out for the light of God to break through into his darkness. That's when he began to go to the word of God in particular, which at that time was not a normal practice for, for someone to just to actually approach the text directly themselves. And he began to cry out to God in prayer. And it was in that moment, in the moment of where he's come to the end of himself in this darkness, that the spirit of God breaks through in revelation for him. This idea of justification by faith and faith alone, that Martin Luther, there's nothing that you have to do, that it is a free gift of grace that you can receive, that the power for breakthrough through this depression and for all mankind, this good news is for you and for all people. And all you have to do is receive it. That came through for him, that word in the midst of his deepest and darkest depression, when he was at the end of himself, on the edge of breakthrough, wondering if God was even listening to him at all. He comes through in this word like we get from John, says the light has come and the light and the darkness has come and the darkness cannot and will not overcome it. And he wanted to let all of Europe know this. And he did. Breakthrough came from him for him when he was on the edge of his greatest breakdown. Emptied and not sure of where to go to next. And so last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. That proclamation that Jesus said, I have come to give you life to the full. Nothing less. That is available to you right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Even if you're at your lowest of low, you feel like you are at that tipping point at the end of your rope, the invitation is the same for you than when you're at your highest of high. It's always to just step into the grace of the one who created you. The one who is with you in the valley of the shadow of death. The one who who is there to be with you even to the end of the age. The one who is able to keep you from falling. The one who is able to be strong when we are weak. The one who died so that we could truly live. The call and the cry of our hearts this morning, if you are finding yourself in a tipping place moment, is to just cry out for the resources of heaven. There's something beautiful being about the end of your own resources. Getting to that place where you're like, you know what, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what I need. I'm not seeing the breakthrough that I want in my life. And I'm crying out for the resources of heaven. And it's in those moments where time and again, our Savior says, I will come in. I will be all that you need. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that is there for our breakthrough. And as we close out, I was just praying. And I think there's, there's two things for us this morning. I don't know if this is for you. But one is confession and one is lifeline. For some of us, I think we hear this message and we put ourselves in the place of the people of God because you are, you are a child of God. And for you, the edge of breakthrough for you right now might come through way of confession. That there are barriers, that there are things in your life that you keep hitting up against. And I believe God wants breakthrough for you this morning. There's no better time than right now to get that stuff out because you are completely welcome, you are completely accepted in this place and in this safe space in the presence of God. And there, there are things that need to be confessed. We confess it to one another. There is healing. And ultimately, you lay it before the Lord and you lay it down. And the other one's lifeline. Do you feel like you're at the end of yourself? Do you feel like, uh, man, I don't know where to turn. I've, I've given all that I can give. I've come to the end of this place. I'm not seeing what I want to see, God. The invitation for you is to cry out for that lifeline this morning. To cry out for that lifeline. Holy Spirit is our power for breakthrough. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome.